Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our next installment of the Washington Stay Home Society. We're so glad that you're joining us this evening. Tonight, we're going to be presenting In Conversation, Dead Feminists and the Creation of Votes for Women, 100 Years and Counting. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, as we get started, I want to begin by acknowledging that the Washington State Historical Society is located on the traditional lands of the Puyallup people who have stewarded the land throughout the generations. We pay respect to their elders, both past and present. So you probably have been wondering what we've been up to. And we're so excited to be talking about this upcoming exhibition. It's unfortunate that we can't all be together at the museum to see the exhibition in person, but we're very excited to bring you the special behind the scenes look about the creation of the exhibition and what you'll be seeing when we reopen. So we're glad that you're joining us for the Washington Stay Home Society program. You'll see the link right there for all of our other upcoming programs and events. You can follow us online. And then also please do consider making a donation that helps support all of our programming. You'll see that link right there. You can click on that become a member, learn a little bit more about donation, learn about Columbia Magazine, and you can make a donation of any amount, big, small, anything in between, and then note that you were really impressed by the program or you want to see more programs like this, and you can do that right there. One program that I want to plug as we get started that we'll have coming up in a virtual format this year is our 15th annual In the Spirit festival and virtual arts market featuring all different contemporary indigenous artists from all over the Pacific Northwest. Um, we'll be having virtual programs from September 10th through October 17th, as well as a arts market. So you can learn a lot more about In the Spirit at www.inthespiritarts.org. But on to our main event. I'm going to invite all of our guests to rejoin me with video so you can see the whole group all at once. Here we all are. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, so we have kind of a two part program. Later on, you're going to be hearing from my colleagues at the Washington State Historical Society. So we'll be joined by Mary Michael Stump. Go ahead and give your salute, Mary Michael. <laughs> Mary Michael is from Texas and that's the drill team salute, but she is currently our director of audience engagement at the Washington State Historical Society. So that means that she provides oversight and strategy for exhibits, public programs, education, and heritage outreach. So you know, really a lot of the fun things that we do at the Historical Society and things that kind of like face outward. Um, before she came to us, she was director of exhibitions at the Southwest School of Art in San Antonio, Texas, holding her position of director of the University Galleries at Texas State University for 17 years. So she knows a little something about designing, jurying, curating, and writing for all of these different independent projects. She also collaborated on a mobile media interpretation application for museums called Musing. So she knows a lot about things like mobile apps, which if you haven't seen ours yet, make sure that you check out our mobile app for the State History Museum. She has also designed and facilitated over 25 evaluation projects focused on visitor experience, exhibitions, and education for a variety of museums. She holds an MA in Museum Studies from Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, and a BFA in Studio Art from Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas. She also studied architectural design at the University of Washington and the College of Built Environments from 1984 to 88. So you'll be hearing from Mary Michael in a little bit. And our other colleague, Gwen Whiting, who you've seen before using the pronoun she and her, she is our lead curator at the Washington State Historical Society. She has curated a number of exhibitions over the years, even before she was curator, and she was our educator for a long time. So some of the exhibitions that you might recognize that Gwen has curated is Hope and Hard Times, Washington during the Great Depression, Cooper, all about Dan Cooper and his uh, hijacking hijinks. And of course, Unlocking McNeil's Past, The Prison, The Place, The People, which incidentally also won a major award from AASLH, the American Association for State and Local History for the Leadership History Award. So you'll be hearing from my colleagues here in a little bit. But first, you'll be hearing from the collaborators on the dead 
feminist project. Thank you so much for joining us, Jessica and Chandler. So the Dead Feminist series is a collaboration between Chandler O'Leary and Jessica Spring. And the series features quotes by historical feminists tied in with current political and social issues. Each limited edition broadside, and we'll talk more about what broadsides are in a little bit, is letterpress printed from hand-drawn lettering and illustrations. A portion of the proceeds of each piece is donated to a cause that aligns with the issue highlighted by the individual artwork. Jessica and Chandler have released 30 broadsides since the series began in 2008. Their book, Dead Feminists, Historic Heroines in Living Color, was published by Sasquatch Books in 2016 and won a Pacific Northwest History Book Award. So we're so thrilled to be joined by these two amazing feminists in their own right and these artists. So thank you so much. And please take it away. Tell us what there is to know about Dead Feminists. Thank you, Molly. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Jessica because she is the boss for a moment here. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I also wanted to thank Len and Molly, Mary Michael and Gwen, uh, as well as exhibit designer Eric Zimmerman and registrar Mackenzie Hotz for the opportunity to collaborate um, on this project, which we'll get into later. But right now, I was going to give you some background on the Dead Feminist Project, as, as Molly mentioned. So uh, there's two of us that collaborate. Chandler um, is an illustrator, super talented illustrator. She has been working on the Drawn the Road blog, which highlights her travels around the country. Not really happening right now, but it has been. Um, and in 2019, she published The Best Coast, this beautiful illustrated travel guide um, that was also published by Sasquatch. And she's currently working on another travel guide about Pacific Northwest Islands that'll be out in 2023. Um, and then I am a letterpress printer. We're coming to you from my shop tonight in Tacoma. Um, and I'll give you a quick definition of letterpress printing. Uh, I'm a book artist, letterpress printer, and it is printing from a raised surface. So this, this photo shows an example of some really, really, really big wood type that I printed. Um, and the other items that you can print from that are type high include linoleum, include metal type. Um, so it's essentially taking a raised surface inking it and rolling it through the press bed to print onto paper. And that's historic letterpress printing. Um, this is my shop here in Tacoma, as I mentioned, and you can see a lot of the presses here, um, all different kinds of presses and the equipment um, is hundreds of years old. So it's a real joy to be able to keep it vital and working. Um, I'm including uh, some pictures from the Waze Goose here in Tacoma. It's a big book art celebration that we participate in every year, except this year. Um, and so this is uh, an image of a huge steamroller print. It's four by five feet carved with linoleum, um, inked up just like I described, but instead of using a press, we're rolling over it with the steamroller. So this illustration is based on Dr. Cora Smith Eaton King, uh, who is a turn of the century women rights activist who fought for suffrage in Washington state. And we thought it was great to include her tonight. Um, to get to the series, uh, the Dead Feminist series, um, we print broadsides, which are essentially um, like a poster. You want to get out a message, um, post it up on the broadside of a barn, and this is how we do it. Um, Chandler is an illustrator, as I mentioned, and uh, I met her when she moved to Tacoma, and I had just been very excited about everything going on with um, the election and really, really hoping Obama would get elected to be, to be honest. And I was so interested in why there was all of this talk about Sarah Palin and these eyeglasses that she wore 
um, instead of talking about what what her her ideals were, it, they were talking about her clothing and everything but what was really at issue. And I found this terrific quote, come, come, my conservative friend, wipe the dew off your spectacles and see the world is moving by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And it struck me as such a perfect quote for the moment. So when I met Chandler, this illustrator, uh, she was new in Tacoma. I was a printer, not an illustrator, asked her, would you maybe draw me a pair of glasses, um, Sarah Palin's glasses? And so Chandler came back to me. She had drawn not just the glasses, but every word on this broadside. And I was amazed. And we got to work printing. And that is really how the series started. Um, we nicknamed it the Dead Feminist series for years. We didn't really say that publicly. And, and she convinced me that we really should call it that. And so we came up with these kind of rules of engagement. Um, it had to be a quote from a dead woman. It had to be um, something that was inclusive and positive, not just negative about men. Um, and so we kept printing these broadsides in the spirit of other uh, suffragist printers like Ida B. Wells, uh, Jovita Idar, and really celebrated the idea of the democratic multiple and really embraced the term feminist. And that's how the series started. And uh, as, as Molly mentioned, we have printed 30 prints so far. Um, the next slide is a quick little movie that will give you an idea of the process and hopefully you'll understand a little more about how these prints are made.
hopefully that helped give you a better idea of the process. Uh, and I wanted to share the finished product, um, a print called Trees of Life, which is uh, profiles eco-feminist Wangari Mathai. She was the founder of the Greenbelt Movement and worked with Kenyan women to plant more than 51 million trees to reforest the environment. Um, she won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004. And one of my favorite things about this print now that sort of the meaning has changed is Chandler included an illustration of a pangolin um, which is hanging there on the tree. The meaning of that, that animal was lost on me before the pandemic, but sadly now I know more about pangolins. Um, I mentioned uh, we, we really focus on doing um, aesthetically different styles with the broadsides, but represent all different women in terms of um, race, and in terms of places they come from geographically. And the, this has all come together. Um, by 2015, we had printed 22 broadsides and we were approached by Sasquatch Books to write a book about the series. Um, the book includes 24 prints. So two of them we had to produce simultaneously um, with the book. And, sort of tuck them in there and then launch the book along with this print of um, Queen Lily Uokalani and celebrate her as the last monarch and the only queen regnant of Hawaii. Um, and this print's called Song of Aloha. The other amazing thing, the opportunity we had with publishing the book was our our publisher Sasquatch agreed that they would donate a portion of all the book sales um, to start a foundation, which we did at the time of the book publishing, which has been really, really exciting as we continue to align donations with uh, social justice causes that we find are important uh, to women and young girls. Um, this is us with two of our heroes, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, um, who were inspiring collaborators over 50 years. Um, you probably heard that Susan B. Um, recently was pardoned, and I don't know that she would have appreciated that pardon, so um, who knows? I don't think so. Um, I mentioned we, we donate a portion of proceeds to nonprofits that align with social justice causes. Um, and this is administered through the Greater Tacoma Community Foundation. And the other really sweet little bonus is every misprint, we create a lemonade journal of the, the prints that don't work out so well. So we, we call that making uh, lemonade out of lemons. I'm gonna have uh, Chandler jump in and talk more about the details of the book and uh, lead us into our exhibition. Um, bear with me here. I'm going to spotlight myself here so you can actually see me. Um, so when we were, our biggest challenge when we were creating this book is that so far up to that point, we had created all of these broadsides and we are still kind of operating in this way where the broadsides are all the same size and they are all about dead women and they all have quotes and they all kind of align with what's going on in the world but that's kind of where the similarities end they all look really different they're done in different styles they reference different historical periods and so when it came time to do the book and bring them all together we were like oh we've got this huge hodgepodge how do we make sense of this how do we make this cohesive and jessica had the really great idea of dividing them up we had 24 broadsides in the book and dividing them up into eight chapters that the name of each chapter was an action verb and because you know what we're trying to do with this series is we're trying to use the power of the press to create some sort of change in the world and so we wanted to encourage our readers to be inspired to create change themselves so we really wanted to, to think of this in terms of being active active verbs so we're just going to highlight um, a few of them here and the main chapter that really speaks to us right now is lead thinking about women who lead. And so we have Harriet Tubman who literally led people to freedom along the Underground Railroad. And the interesting thing that we learned while we were writing this book is when we did this broadside in 2009, 
the quote that we chose, which is always remember you have within you the strength, the patience and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. Great quote, right? Well, we didn't, nobody knew this in 2009, but it came out a few years later that that quote is fake. Harriet Tubman never said those words. And in fact, we're not sure that those words actually belong to any historical figure. It may be totally fictional. And so we, what was interesting for us, other than the fact that, oh no, we have this fictional quote, but the piece already dealt with fictional themes. So we were talking about the legend that has grown up around the Underground Railroad alongside the fact. So we referenced the quilt code, which was this idea that people would find safe houses by a quilt hanging out of the window or on a line. Turns out that's fictional as well. And we knew that at the time, but it just, this idea of the myth growing and building was really fascinating to us. Um, this was this is one that was really close to our hearts. These are the Washington State suffragists. What, women in Washington State got the vote 10 years before women did nationally with the 19th Amendment. And the women of Washington State came from all different political backgrounds. They came from different geographical backgrounds and they fought a lot. Um, I would love to have been there for their meetings. They um, came together to publish a cookbook for the, in 1909 for the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition in, in Seattle, which was like a world's fair. And basically it's a, they, they knew that they had to get men to vote for them to gain the vote. So they thought, well, the best way to a man's heart or vote was through his stomach. So they wrote this cookbook. It is filled with voter propaganda. And um, the quote we chose is from the introduction is, are not our desserts and salads things of beauty and the joy of the moment? But my other favorite quote from the book is, give us the vote and we will cook together for a wide outlook, which I think is great. And finally, we have Shirley Chisholm, who has been in the news again lately because she uh, was the first African-American woman who made it onto a major party ticket in 1972 when she ran for president. Now, of course, she didn't win the nomination. She gave all of her delegates to George McGovern, who then lost in a landslide to Richard Nixon. Um, but she was such a fascinating character to us um, because her quote really gets to the heart of the issue. The one thing you've got going is your one vote. And um, what's interesting about her is that she also brings up issues of race, of course, but also um, gender equality and equal pay. When she was elected to Congress before she ran for president, she was one of the few women in America who actually made the exact same salary as her male counterparts because her pay was, con was congressionally mandated. And the, her fellow colleagues, her white male colleagues in Congress hated that. They hated the fact that she made the same amount that they did. And we love that tidbit. She also befriended um, George Wallace, Mr. Segregation Now, Segregation Forever. Um, there was an assassination attempt on his life and she visited him in the hospital and he was so touched by this that they became very good friends and they actually lobbied for each other in Congress uh, and in other areas of government for many years to come. So really interesting stories that come up while we're working on these broadsides and we loved being able to share these stories further through the book that we don't have the luxury of doing at the little tiny paragraph of biography at the bottom of each print. After the book came out, the book came out in 2016, just a month, less than a month before the presidential election. And we were really hoping that we could celebrate the election of the first woman president. And of course, that's not what happened. Um, and then of course, there has been so much unrest and strife and protests that has happened since then. And we have been angry and protesting right along with people. And um, we found that our series has really changed in that time. We, before the book came out and before that election, our, our series was much more general, I think, more aspirational and much, there was much more veiled metaphor in our pieces, lots of visual imagery that had hidden meaning to it. We got much more explicit after that. And the first one that came out after that election was um, our print called Save Our Ship or SOS. And um, we really felt like we were in a dark place after that election. We were so angry and disappointed and dismayed. And we weren't alone. There were a lot of people, especially women, who felt that way. And so we printed this print on black paper because we felt like we were in the dark and we wanted to feature points of light. So we quoted Grace Darling, who was an English 
lighthouse keeper and her quote is at the time I believe I had very little thought of anything but to exert myself to the fullest and she's referring to the night that she in a rowboat in a storm rescued a bunch of men who had washed up in a shipwreck on her father's lighthouse and she and her father rode out there at like two o'clock in the morning and rescued all of these people and and basically she was saying I didn't even think about it I just did what I had to do and that's that was the sentiment we wanted to carry forward so we feature her quote in glow in the dark ink so you can kind of see that darker black that's on the background that is glow in the dark ink and the ring that the ring of little circles that goes around that lighthouse those are other women lighthouse keepers from around the english speaking world at the time so we thought of ourselves as being in this network of women around the world who can count on each other as points of light in the world to get ourselves through whatever this time is however long it lasts Finally, um, today we actually released our 30th broadside in honor of Women's Equality Day. And today is also the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment being certified, which means that today's the day it actually became law. There have been a lot of anniversaries this year with the 19th Amendment. You've probably heard it in the news. Um, but today's the day we chose for this. And when we started our series with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, we knew there were problematic things about her, namely that she, she was a white lady but also her, the fellow members of the movement, the suffragists, they deliberately excluded their black colleagues. And they even resorted to racist rhetoric when they were lobbying to get women the vote. And that was a major problem and it was never solved. And so when the 19th amendment became legal, it technically gave the vote to all women in America. However, there were so many other local laws on the books, loopholes in the law, that it effectively disenfranchised many women, especially Black women, Indigenous women, other women of color, for decades to come. And a lot of this was fixed and solved by the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. However, that law is still the law of the land now. But there are still loopholes, there are still provisions that have been struck down by the, the Supreme Court. So there are still people around the country, women and men, who are, face obstacles to voting even today. So that's what we wanted to focus on for this print. So we focused on a Black suffragist, Ida B. Wells. And Ida B. Wells also is referred to as a mother of intersectionalism. And intersectionalism is a term coined in 1989 by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw. And what that means is the intersection of different things. So women who are black may face racism and sexism. Um, issues may be complex. So there may be issues of class or race or um, geography or religion involved. And so all of these things come together to make complex issues and that's intersectionalism. So for our piece, the quote is the, very simple. The way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. But the tricky bit is that we printed this in such a way that two colors overlap, red and blue, to make suffrage purple. Purple was the traditional color of the suffragist movement, but we didn't actually print the color purple. We only printed red and blue, and the text is only readable through the intersection of those two colors. So that's our big clever thing for this print. So here we are today. We are 100 years later after the, the passage of the 19th Amendment, and we are still fighting many of the same things that Ida B. Wells was fighting back in her day that the white suffragists were fighting in their day. We're still fighting, fighting voter suppression. We're still fighting for people's voices to be heard. And especially black women are still putting their literal bodies on the line in the face of violence, in the face of discrimination. And, and so we're trying to remember this moment and trying to remind ourselves to be as inclusive as we can and to fight for those of us who don't necessarily have the same privileges that we do. Um, and this brings us to when the staff at the Washington State History Museum approached us about helping them develop the Votes for Women 100 Years and Counting exhibition. They knew about the series and we had long chats with Gwen and Mary Michael about how uh, what we did might dovetail in with what they were looking for for the exhibition. And um, the biggest thing, and I'm sure that we're gonna talk about this later, but we didn't want to view the suffrage movement is something that was dead and in the past. We wanted to talk about 
how democracy is very much alive and it's very much needs to still be fought for because the, the, it's still people are nibbling away at it and taking huge bites out of it and trying to change things even as we speak. And so we wanted to, to not only teach our visitors about the suffrage movement and how women gained the vote, and but we wanted to talk about everything that happened since then. And we wanted to give an idea of this through playing a game. And Mary Michael's gonna share a lot more about that in a little bit. So I'll, I'm not gonna kind of steal her thunder here. But part of our job as artists in developing this show was developing a cohesive look for the whole exhibition. And um, we, wanted to be inspired by the sorts of things that inspire us in our series, which is historical imagery, historical lettering and typography. Um, and so you can see it, it has kind of that Victorian era look to it overall. So very turn of the century, we're trying to reference the, the time period that the suffragists were working in. But also um, we wanted to give a nod to our background as letterpress printers and Jessica in particular, she has this incredible collection of metal cuts and ornaments, which were little, they're kind of like the, the early equivalent to clip art. These were stock illustrations that were just cut out of metal and you could print on little newsletters or on your business card. And so we incorporate these everywhere throughout the, the, the imagery for the show. So you'll find the owl throughout on anywhere where it says, did you know? Um, we also have this little, this woman holding a scale, a balance, and we have nicknamed her Lady Justice. So anytime in the exhibition, you see that the Supreme Court weighs in on an issue or um, something has to get decided or something um, we think of an outcome as being fair or unfair, you see Lady Justice appear. Um, and so I'm, we're going to turn this over to the folks at the Washington State History Museum. But if you want to learn more about our series, we have, and I, I know Len is going to put some things into the chat here for you for live links, but we have, we're at deadfeminist.com. You can find us on Instagram as well at deadfeminist. Uh, and if you'd like to learn more about our fund, you can, you can find that as well. So uh, we want to raise a toast to Alice Paul, one of the suffragists. She sewed the suffrage flag one star for every state that ratified the 19th Amendment. And when it was all done, when 36 states ratified, she unfurled that baby from the balcony. <laughs> so raising a toast to everybody today. I'm going to unspotlight myself here. Thank you so much. That was, I, your work is just totally stunning and beautiful. And I can't wait to talk about it more. Something that I always forget to say, Chandler keeps referencing Len. Len is our programs facilitator who is managing everything on the Facebook Live end. So as you have questions or thoughts, feel free to put them in the chat. At the end of all of the presentations, we'll circle back, have a discussion, and also um, ask those questions that you're putting in the thread. So make sure that you're commenting, asking all those questions, and Len will get that to us on the back side. I always forget that. So thank you for, <laughs> for putting those in. But beautiful presentation. I can't wait to talk more. So to hear more about how everything got created as the exhibition, Mary Michael and Gwen are going to give their presentation. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. And um, let's see, Gwen, are you ready? You ready to do this? I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Um, Chandler and Jessica, thank you so much. I mean, you have just shown everybody watching why it is that we had to have you working on this project. Um, Chandler and Jessica worked for us uh, in another project called A Thousand Words Worth. And I think it was Gwen who first, when they, when they, when she saw what, um, what Jessica and Chandler had done with interpreting objects from our collection to tell stories with them. Uh, I think we sort of both looked at each other and said, they're the ones for this project. So um, we're so honored and excited for you to be able to show your stuff in this, um, in this context. Um, let's see. Okay. So Gwen, you want to talk about um, what we did a decade ago? Sure. So as some of you who followed the museum for a while might remember, uh, 10 years ago, 
Um, it was the centennial of the day when, or the time when Washington women gained suffrage. Um, for the final time, Washington women won and lost the vote several times prior to finally gaining it in 1910. Well, before that time, there had been a, about a 14 year gap um, during which no states had passed women's suffrage. And once Washington passed it, it opened the way for the rest of the states to kind of gradually um, begin passing it all the way up until 1920 when it was ratified nationally. So when we did the suffrage centennial, there were a number of products that came out of that. Um, we did a massive exhibition, we did curriculum, we did a huge amount of programming, and there was an accompanying book from WSU Press. So one of the challenges when we started thinking about this new exhibition was, okay, well, we we did so much in um, 1910 or in about 1910 and 2010, what else is left to do and how should we do it? And that's kind of what led us to start thinking about this exhibition in a very different way. So uh, fast forward a decade and it's uh, 2020. And not only were we fielding questions from people around who were saying like, didn't we just do that? Didn't we, didn't we do that 10 years ago? Um, the story of women's suffrage in Washington is um, certainly one we're celebrating and we donned our white linen and our sashes and, and did all that, but it's not as complicated or nuanced as the national story. And so what we, um, and because we had just done that um, in 2010, we sort of not only knew what we wanted this to be, but we knew also what we didn't want it to be. So we developed some um, outcomes that were really wide ranging. They had to do with increasing civic engagement for women in Washington and both celebrating the historical and current women of Washington and helping the public understand the long-term effects, the legacy of the suffrage movement in creating equality we wanted the public to also understand where Washington stood today in terms of gender equality. And we also wanted the public to understand Washington's role in, in the larger suffrage movement and how Washington women really did lead the way. So because of that, we developed a whole bunch of things. We developed um, for the state suffrage centennial commemoration, our uh, suffrage coordinator, Elisa Law, helped uh, develop curriculum, a panel exhibit, and we just finished our suffrage special whistle stop tour, which is a virtual trip through the state um, and suffrage history starting in Spokane, ending in Olympia with six stops in between. And you can find those on our YouTube channel. I'm sure Lynn has those, uh, that link put in our uh, chat box to the side. But the, but the keystone and sort of cornerstone for us here at the museum was an on-ground, is an on-ground exhibition that um, we titled simply Votes for Women, 100 Years and Counting. Um, we engaged Jessica and Chandler not only because of their creative talents, but their dedication to diving deep into history and teasing out all the things that are so important in terms of telling this sort of non-singular but singularly focused story. Um, as a part of that, Gwen, you wanna talk about uh, games and the role of games sure. in the suffrage movement? So when we first started develop, thinking about this exhibition, one of the things that we looked at was, okay, what were suffragists talking about at the time and how were they kind of getting the word out there? Um, we, have, we have several cookbooks, um, as was mentioned earlier. Um, so, but women were using like a whole number of strategies for informing people. And so there were cookbooks, there were marches, there were protests, but they were also doing things like games. Um, several board games were produced, mostly in England, to try to convince people to side with suffragists. And um, as you can see here, you were often putting yourself in the position of one of these women and literally fighting for the vote around a game board. 
And um, we thought that was a really interesting and fun idea. And at museums, we're always looking for ways to be interactive and different, and especially to capture the attention of our younger audiences and make history new and fun and exciting and also relevant to them. Because, you know, we see a lot of students and when you're a middle school student, you're not necessarily thinking these things that women did a hundred years ago really matter to you today. And so we wanted a way to kind of capture that imagination and to take people through history, not just the early part of the suffrage movement, but also kind of use the game to draw it forward into today and things that we're talking and thinking about right now. So <laughs> it brings us literally to today, Women's Equality Day. Um, the exhibition was supposed to open on April the 9th and it was supposed to run through August 30th. We were going to really ramp up to the celebration of women's suffrage in the United States, teasing out all the legacies of that and the history of voting rights in the United States. Unfortunately, we vacated the building on March the 17th and everybody uh, that we know went sort of under their respective rocks and we started retooling the exhibition schedule, watching weeks turn into months, and you know, emailing Chandler intermittently and saying, can you change the dates to X? Can you change the dates to Y? And finally, she just changed the dates to coming soon because we just really didn't know. But um, I do wanna make a point that one of the most serendipitous things is that um, you know our commitment to this exhibition never wavered, and we will celebrate the legacy of women's suffrage and the history of voting rights anytime we can get a chance to do so. That said, today being sort of the kickoff date for this, having just gotten word that museums can open in phase two, and we're making plans to do so at the museum, it's really kind of exciting that um, fate moved this exhibition into the fall and it will be up through this historic election um, and we're going to have it up actually through January the 31st so that um, so that we can see it as it's as history is playing out in real time and I think it's going to be I think a lot of the content is going to be even more salient in, in that particular historic season um, than it might have been leading up to uh, Women's Equality Day. So we're, we're making lemonade too uh, out of lemons, Chandler and Jessica. But you see here the graphic look and feel of not only the branding, um, but the exhibition itself. And, you know, we want to play the game at Victory Vote. That is, uh, that's the title that we finally landed on. But um, I think you're going to see this, these colors, these graphics uh, go throughout the exhibition as it, as it um, unfolds. So Chandler, did you ever think that your, uh, <laughs> <laughs> when we met, we met with Chandler and Jessica in the very studio that they're broadcasting from tonight, and um, we started talking about how to make this complex and nuanced history into a game. Gwen, you want to say a little bit about your memory of that day? Well, <laughs> I say it was a lot. There's a lot of laughter. <laughs> um, it was just such a big history. And so as you can kind of see here, we started brainstorming on paper because I'd say all of us to some extent are visual thinkers. Uh, I like words too, but it does help to have things drawn out. And so we were trying to think of, you know, what will this space actually look like? How on earth are we going to turn, ask people to kind of play a game in a gallery when they're not used to that? What are game pieces going to look like? How will we organize this? You know, where will we put objects? There were a lot of big, big, big questions. And as we kind of walk through this, you'll see all of the various things that we did to try to outline that before we actually started building. Exactly. And how do we get all this dense amount of information and um, all the layers of things that create lenses for each other into one space? 
It is a so, hundred years of history, which is a lot. <laughs> it is because really we talk a little bit about Seneca Falls leading up to 1920. We give a, a primer is what we call it, a primary in the um, section before you learn how to play the game. But really the game takes off uh, after the 19th Amendment is certified and what that means for those people who could vote. And as Chandler mentioned, all the other people that uh, got left behind, women in particular. So the structure of the exhibition that, um, that you see here, you walk into a section that we're calling the primary, uh, which actually introduces you, it's kind of a leveling small gallery that gets you up to speed, all things 19th Amendment. Then we go into a section that's an introduction. It's a kind of you practice playing the game. Uh, and then you go into the larger gallery space that show that that's actually the game itself divided into six voting sections. And then with a timeline that goes around the perimeter of the space that really anchors the stories that uh, Jessica and Chandler have started teasing out in the content of each section. And then at the very end, when you're finished playing the game, you go to what, um, what they call the exit poll where you get a chance to give feedback about what you learned or some synthesizing information. And you also come across these phenomenal women in what we are calling the wall of women. And um, Chandler and Jessica are doing their sort of brilliant moves on uh, in terms of the look, graphic look and feel of that. So Eric Zimmerman, as, um, as Jessica mentioned, our exhibitions designer has given us some 3D modeling here. And what you see here is the game space. Each of the six sections are represented by a separate color. Um, and I wonder, you know, I wanna talk later with Chandler and Jessica about how they made those decisions, what, you know, where those colors came from, what they were thinking and how they use them really as a as a component in the game itself. But I remember talking about the names of these uh, sections, Franchise Forest, Gerrymandering Lane, Majority Mountain, Ratification Acres, Civil Rights Corner, and Women's Club Woods. And I, I, I think that um, if I recall correctly, and, and you all jump in, we thought about we, they wanted to reference games like Candyland or Shoots and Ladders or something where, you know, there's a, a, um, a generous use of alliteration and, um, and some attempts at um, framing each section in a way that is still sort of fun and playful, even though the content is pretty dense. Um, you, and Chandler and Jessica, you guys jump in any any time you're ready. Um, we were blown away when Chandler first sent us the graphics um, because, as you can see, these refer to the um, the printing pieces that are in Jessica's collection. But they each, um, each of the, there's each of the, you'll choose an icon when you first start the game that will be either the shoe, the telephone, the chair, the needle and thread, the globe, or the quill ink, and inkwell. And um, we, she actually gave us a choice of a whole lot more, but these are the ones that we narrowed it down. And depending on, you'll play as the shoe or the globe or whatever all the way through the game. And that will determine your um, sequence, your path, that from once what section to what section do you go to. And then these little icons that you see here on the right are uh, things that appear over and over again, not only in the exhibition panels in each section, but also in the timeline itself to help cross-reference. So how lucky we are to have these beautiful, beautiful, um, graphics. Gwen, you want to talk about the day that we played? <laughs> we played and failed. Um, <laughs> so uh, myself and the exhibition designer, as Molly mentioned earlier, I was an educator before I was a curator. And so because of that, 
when I work on exhibits and also because I have a lot of children, <laughs> I think about how are families and kids going to move through this space and then how is the general public going to move through this space and how are people who you know, know history going to move through this space. And one of the things I was concerned about for everybody was um, how will people actually play the game in a way that makes sense. And so as you can see here, myself and Eric, the exhibit designer, we sat around and mocked up this game, <laughs> the first iteration of how you played the game, which was a failure <laughs> by making little spinning wheels and making little cards. And we had this very, very elaborate way of going through it. And we found through various playthroughs that certain ways of doing it were just absolutely confusing and wouldn't work. And other way, and then until, so we kind of played it through and talked it through until finally um, Chandler and Jessica actually gave us the path and we saw the light <laughs> into finding the way that it would be easiest to move through the game. Um, and we're only you sharing this with you so that you know that, I mean, you, you just cannot imagine the number of hours that the four of us sat there kind of go, or five of us going like, wait a minute now, if that if you go there and then there and then there we each did that independently um and i love the note at the top that says note this is just an example of how the randomization could work so don't do this at home <laughs> yeah because everything we were basing at the time which seems a little ironic now was based on five people groups because that is the average size of a chaperone group in our um when our school field trips come and so everything had to work so that five people could be at a station at each time that's the other thing that's so ironic we've we've established you know we worked so hard to come up with a way to make this content so interactive and so what but we have we we have um we have a plan as they say <laughs> so this is the uh floor plan of the space itself you'll enter into the primary section which um like I said, we'll give you kind of a, uh, it'll get you up to speed about all things um, women's suffrage in the United States and starting at um, Seneca Falls. Do you, uh, Chandler and Jessica, do either of you want to talk about the things that you'll find in the primary? Um, it's so funny because that was actually what we were trying to flesh out whenever when the world shut down and so that is probably the most nebulous part of the show still um but we one of the things we really wanted to do um was jessica jessica got a hold of this incredible book called sisters in spirit and it's about how the early suffragists at the seneca falls convention in 1848 were uh influenced by indigenous peoples on the East Coast. So um, we all, we white folks were taught to call them the Iroquois people, but they call themselves the Haudenosaunee and they are confederated um, tribes in what is now New York state. And their societal principles are, were very, very different than uh, white society in America at the time. And many of their principles uh, they they had incredibly forward thinking principles for women and how and their role in society and their democratic role in society and so these suffragists took a lot of these ideas and kind of incorporated them into what they wrote and came up with for the Seneca Falls Convention. So this is this was something we really wanted to highlight at the beginning of the show just to, to to demonstrate that these ideas didn't come out of nowhere. So that's kind of where the show starts. Right. So, and then from there you go into an intro gallery, as you see here, like I said, teaches you how to play the game, then you go into the game and then you go out through the exit poll where you can um, give some feedback. Here's just another view that um, Eric gave us. Um, you see the primary on the lower right hand corner and you can kind of see how the places, um, the spaces intersect and and uh, relate to each other. We got, like I've mentioned, we got an incredible timeline that um, that that Gwen and Chandler and Jessica um, have worked on. And in that, you'll get really sort of 
reproduced images of ephemera, framed actual pieces of ephemera, um, the graphic look and feel pieces that you get, and some change makers. So we want to celebrate women from all time, all uh, walks of life, um, and there are some incredible stories here that um, all of whom, you know, worked behind the scenes or in front of the scenes to make things happen along the way from 1920 to now. It's interesting, I guess we're gonna have to make one more panel since we have a woman vice president uh, candidate now. But um, this is, these are just some scenes that you'll see, uh, you know, being in the space. And this is a sample of from our exhibition designer that tells you kind of how the panels work. Um, you have a spinner where you either lose a vote or you get to keep your vote. You'll have a you'll have a wooden discs that allow you to vote on objects once you read the content, um, and you can apply what you've learned to the objects that Chandler and Jessica have chosen for that section. If you don't lose your vote, you get to vote and we'll, we'll actually see in real time uh, which objects are winning by um, the little place where people put their votes. So we're gonna walk you through a couple of these sections very quickly because um, we know we're running a little long, but we picked um, two sections, Franchise Forest and Women's Club Woods. Um, I picked Franchise Forest because in this uh, section, we talk, they talk a lot about um, obviously disenfranchisement, but also um, we tease out the, the um, when absentee voting first came to be and, and the security of that and the history of that. Anybody, any of you all wanna talk about um, this page? There are two panels per section that give you all the history you're going to need to then apply that to which objects you think best represent the concepts uh, in each section. I think it's interesting that the 19th Amendment didn't really speak to anything other than nobody can be denied the right to vote based on sex, but it doesn't talk about all of these other ways in which people can be disenfranchised. Um, one thing I, think I do want to oh, say, one thing that I think is particularly interesting about this panel, and it's reiterated on the timeline in a little more depth, is it also talks about age. Um, we're used to thinking that, you know, you turn 18, you, you can vote, but of course, that's a relatively recent um, change. And that happened in the 1970s that the voting age got lowered in the US from 21 to 18 because of the Vietnam War. Um, and so the question of age is, uh, and voting and at what point people should be old enough to vote, I think kind of keeps coming up again and again in history. And so to me, this is kind of an interesting little tidbit that comes out in this particular panel. Um, Mary Beth, can I, and Gwen, can I jump in real quick too? Please, yeah. Um, so one of the things that, so I, this is one that I tackled and um, this was one that, that was so interesting for me for using all of our little vintage cuts, our little historic types, because first of all, we had a ton of information to include on this page, um, but, and, and that was a huge challenge, but also it was really great to get, it was interesting to get really nitty gritty with all of the metaphor behind all of these imageries. And so um, having like felony status, we have the, the lock there and the disability, we have assistive aids like, like glasses, but I also, I need to give a shout out. I'm just dying to get nerdy about this. Um, when we came down to poor ballot design, there's, there's a whole history about ballot design that we really couldn't get into with this, but um, I, I had to put a bug on there. <laughs> so I kind of was, I was nerding out with Jessica about that. And she's like, you are just such a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll see there's little Easter eggs like that throughout the exhibition that we we really get metaphoric with a lot of the things. And as we're, we'll talk about in a bit about the objects, the objects are really metaphorical as well. Mm -hmm. Here, so here's the, um, here's the ballot. Uh, you wanna talk a little bit about this Chandler? Um, um, 
I think it's interesting. Probably a lot of people don't know that during the Civil War, uh, that's when absentee is an absentee ballot um, voting first sort of came on the scene. Um, yeah, um, yeah, and, and also that was when, not too long after that, is when they also developed the secret ballot, and the, they also called that the Australian ballot because it was first used in Tasmania in Australia. And before that, voting was, I can't even imagine, it must have been just terrifying because any um, ballots were privately printed. So newspapers would print them, employers would print them, and people would be conveniently left off of ballots if an employer didn't like that person. Um, you had to do it in public. And so there'd be these basically press gangs would come and intimidate you, or they would pay impersonators to come up and vote, vote multiple times, or they'd pay people to come in from out of state. It was completely insane. And so the fact that the secret ballot and the absentee ballots that we take for granted were revolutionary at the time. And so just delving into this stuff was a huge learning experience for us um, yeah. to get into these objects and things as well. So, and it says here in the late 19th century, the US adopted election and security standards. So, I mean, we're all okay, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna start, uh, we're gonna leave the, the panels and talk about voting. Um, the next step that you would do if you were in the gallery is you would go to the, the suffrage spinning wheel and before all this happened, you would spin that with your hand. But we have these little tools that we ordered with the uh, with our logo on it, just so that you can be safe. And you'll come to this suffrage wheel. There's a different one for each section. And the reason why there's a different one, there are various uh, parts of the wheel, depending on where your spin lands, you either lose your vote or you're encouraged to cast your vote. And so things like your ID doesn't match your married name, if, if that comes up, um, wah, 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 you, don't, you lose your vote and you have to put your uh, token into a section that says you didn't get to vote. So there are objects in each section uh, that um, were selected by uh, Jessica and Chandler um, with a little help from Gwen uh, to begin with. And these are the three things, the three, two pairings and a singular object that you would vote on in this section franchise for us. So Gwen, you wanna kind of briefly describe what each of these are? Okay, do you want me to do it here? Or do you want me to do it on the, pages the individual. Oh yeah, good, okay. So the first one. So I'll describe these and then if Chandler and Jessica have anything else they wanna say, feel free to jump in. Um, there are two objects here on the left, you see a ballot box. Um, this was actually used by the Rebecca's about 1890 to 1939 or so. And it's a fairly common type of voting that was happening early on with the little balls dropping into the box of different colors. Um, and then on the right, you see chads um, from 2000. And this is actually pretty fascinating to me that we even have this because it's the sort of thing you would normally expect to have been thrown away. Um, but instead they were collected and mailed to us. <laughs> on the, um, this one on the left side, this is a cartoon that was actually published in a magazine called Votes for Women in 1910 which was a magazine that was really influential across the country in terms of promoting women's um, getting the vote. On the right side, you see an unusual thing called a hoodwink. And you may have heard this term before when someone gets hoodwinked. It actually comes from this particular device, um, which was used um, often in conjunction with secret societies. And if you, you could see the little knobs on the top, those closed it so that the person wearing the hoodwink could not see if you pulled them up, you could see. So when someone says you've been hoodwinked, they're referring to the fact of having something put over your eyes. And uh, this particular artifact is actually one of my favorites in our collection. It is a safe door that was used by um, Rebecca Howard. Um, Rebecca was a black businesswoman in the 1860s in Olympia. Um, in fact, she was pretty, she was responsible 
um, in part for the rise of Olympia um, because she was extremely successful, um, owned a lot of real estate and ended up donating a huge amount of land so that the railroad could be built and come to the city, um, which resulted of course um, in it becoming a more dominant presence in the state of Washington or the territory in the state. <laughs> Can I add something about that safe door? Yeah. Um, so the other reason we, th there was a secondary reason why we chose that, um, we get metaphorical with that one because in Franchise Forest, we talk about, oh, thanks Molly. Um, we talk about <laughs> in Franchise Forest, how there are many people who believe that um, election security and avoiding fraud is more important than enfranchising as many people as we can. So that safe door has come to uh, symbolize election security and this question. So now we know what object Chandler would vote for in this section. <laughs> so you're going, when you start your game, you're going to get six of these wooden tokens, um, each of which will be allow you to cast your ballot in each of the six sections. Unless you lose your vote with that suffrage wheel, if you lose your vote and you have to put it in the section that says lost votes, then you have to go to the a table in the center of the space called the community caucus. And you have to do an action of some sort that's suggested um, there in order to regain a vote so that you can actually finish the uh, game in each of the six sections. I'm gonna, we're gonna, in the interest of time, we're gonna go through Women's Club Woods again, but, um, you know, at a little quicker clip, but uh, we wanted to show two different sections so that you could get the sense of what each section would be like and how they, how they actually were similar. Uh, and how they are dissimilar. So uh, Women's Club Woods, Chandler, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the role of women's clubs in suffrage? Uh-oh, I can't hear you. Okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. Jessica, I think, is really the expert on this one, but the women's club movement, which is, you know, any club, they, they could be reading clubs, they could be singing clubs, they could be political, they could be apolitical. Women's clubs were really instrumental in helping women get the vote. They did a ton of lobbying and organizing and marching. Um, and one of the really prominent women's club leaders was Ida B. Wells, who we featured in our broadside. Ida B. Wells was living in Chicago at the time. She moved there from the South and she founded several women's clubs in Chicago. And her, one of the most prominent ones was the Alpha Suffrage Club. They were responsible for electing Chicago's first black alderman just two years after they found, were founded and they didn't even have the right to vote themselves nationally. Um, they also, um, the members of the Alpha Suffrage Club went to the 1913 National March on Washington for women's suffrage. And um, Ida B. Wells refused to march in the back of the parade when she was asked to by the white suffragists. So she just waited in the crowd until the Chicago delegation went by and she just jumped in there and they <laughs> marched with the white suffragists as they should have been able to do. So it was these women's clubs who were really instrumental in bringing a lot of these things together. So we really wanted to highlight that as one of the stations because there's a ton of history here and a ton of local history as well. Like Narcissa Whitman, who was on the other side of the Cascades, she was a major uh, women's club proponent and leader. Also, it was a women's clubs uh, among the mountaineers. Uh, there are a lot of women mountaineers. They were the ones who climbed Mount Rainier with Cora Smith Eaton King and they planted a votes for women flag at the summit. That flag is still there in the crater of Mount Rainier over a hundred years later. It's under buried under snow and ice, but it is there. Um, so yeah, just tons of info that we can really dig into here. Great, so let's, uh, so this is an example of the spinning wheel. Um, it's not necessarily the one you would find in Women's Club Woods, but it is, um, you can see it uh, closer than you can see, oh, cast, if it landed on, you celebrated Women's Equality Day on August 26, which all of you are, you would get to cast your vote. But unfortunately, um, 
it's July 1969 and you're 18 years old, but you must be 21 years old to vote, you would lose your vote if, if, if the spinning wheel ended up on that one for you. So um, here are the objects. Let's take a look and Gwen can sort of walk us through again. We have three different um, options for your vote. We have the first one. So the first set of options, and you know, feel anyone can feel free to jump in on this, but we have a miniature flat iron, which is very tiny, that was made around 1860. Um, tools like this, or I should say, toys that became tools like this were actually really common, and you know, still are um, for children. But in this era, they were more directed towards girls exclusively. Um, on the right, you see a needlework kit, um, which is produced sometime in the mid-century. Um, so you can kind of make a guess based on the fact that this is a mending kit on and produced, you know, between you know, 1950, 1960s or so, um, at who this would have been, this particular promotion would have been directed at. Um, this piece on the left, you see a cordial glass, and this kind of references um, one of the ideas in women's clubs, club woods, which is that women were really um, one of the causes that women really campaigned for was temperance um, or the prohibition or moderation of alcohol. And so this references that. Um, on the right, there is a medallion that was probably owned by um, suffragist Emma Page, who was an Olympia suffragist. Um, she was also blind and she did a lot of work around causes like temperance, um, animal welfare, um, and of course, advocating to win the vote. She, as I understand it, she made those medallions as rewards for oratorical performance. So they would have contests and then the winner would get a medallion from her. Do we get one tonight? <laughs> <laughs> I can't make medallions, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'll have my uh, six-year-old make one for you. <laughs> tokens, we can use those. <laughs> So this is a rhododendron stamp. Um, and many of you may know that this is the state flower, but you might not know is that women were allowed to vote for the state flower between rhododendron and clover. Um, it became quite a controversy. There were actually some really bitter battles about which flower was better to represent Washington state. Um, but in the end, team Rhodey won. <laughs> <laughs> and so symbolically important because it was really the first chance Washington women got to vote. And also only women got to vote on that. Men were actually not invited to vote on that one. So, all right. Wow. <laughs> so at this point, you would take another one of your wooden tokens and you would put it in the box that uh, corresponds with the objects on view that you think best uh, represent the content that you have read and consumed. And then, like I said, you can see in real time uh, what objects are winning. One of the things that you need to do in the community caucus, if you were to lose your vote, is to go and um, campaign for an object that you really want to win uh, for somebody else in the, in the room. So, I, we anticipate really some stiff races in each of these six sections. Um, the last piece, after you finish with going through all six sections, the last part of the exhibition and the game uh, that you'll go to is the exit poll. And the exit poll is something that um, we have talked a lot about. We want people to be able to give feedback, like I said, and kind of talk about with each other and leave the residue of what they've learned uh, in the in the space itself through some other feedback cues. Um, and many, many thanks to Ben Helly at the um, State Archives who we're crossing every finger that we have that we can um, get a vintage actual voting machine that he found um, and so that because people in Washington state, they, you know, I mean, if you've, 
we vote by mail. And so voting, a voting machine, a voting booth is kind of a exotic thing to us now. So we're excited about that. Um, anybody want to talk about the wall of women? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Um, so this is another thing that we are still working on. Um, <laughs> We were in the thick of it when the world went kablooey. And so what we really, we, a byproduct of putting together all of these separate parts of the exhibition and the timeline and everything is there were so many women's stories that we couldn't tell because there just isn't space. We would need the entire state full of space to, to be able to start telling the story. So we wanted to be able to honor all the other women who have run for office or the women who have helped people get the vote, women who were journalists, women who were teachers, club leaders. Um, and so to, to make a, a joke about binders full of women, we were all laughing about that. And we thought, no, wait a minute, what if we actually had kind of a collage of these women and we don't necessarily have the space to tell their stories in the space, but we can link people in the wider world to the internet, to apps, to um, so we can write more about these women. And so we wanted to have as diverse a group as we could. We wanted to have women across the political spectrum, um, Democratic, Republican, Independent. We wanted to have uh, women of color. We wanted to have women who are still alive and still serving in office or on a judicial bench somewhere. We wanted to have um, we, we wanted to have trans women. We wanted to have disabled women. We wanted to have a really broad spectrum to try to paint a picture of all of the different voices and points of view that have come together and are still working to bring women everywhere an equal chance at democracy. Mm -hmm. We also intend to figure out, we're not exactly sure how that's gonna happen yet, but for visitors to share their own women, um, whether it's from their family or people we haven't represented in the wall of women and bring their own stories to share. And we'll have a spot for um, anybody who's so inclined can stand in front of a particular prescribed spot in the wall of women and take a selfie of themselves and put themselves in there as well. So yeah, I mean, the exhibition was supposed to open April 9th, but we really have taken advantage of the extra time <laughs> that COVID-19 has given us to really fully flesh out these things and, um, and, and add even more rich layers of meaning, I think, in this, um, not just the exit poll, but the whole exhibition. So Ben says that that voting booth weighs three tons. So um, I'm gonna have to get Eric um, thinking about that. We can do it. He says it's on wheels though, so that's okay. <laughs> so at, what's up? Real quick, I think the other thing is that we've taken advantage of this time to keep adding things because things are still happening that are really important to this story. I mean, all of a sudden we have a, a woman vice presidential candidate on a major party ticket and she's could potentially be the first woman vice president. She could also be the first black woman vice president, the first South Asian woman vice president. So these are all really important components of the story and they're still happening. So we're going to just keep going as long as we That's can. right. That's right. We'll add to it as it goes anyway. At the end of, every, of the game, your payoff is that um, you, you get a sticker that says I voted, a special one designed by Chandler and Jessica um, when you sort of turn in your um, voting key and that's I have to say so I'm a transplant from Texas and I will say the one thing I miss I love mail-in voting but the one thing I miss about voting at the polls is that you get that little sticker and you wear it with pride all day and you put it on your social media and so that strip that comes at the top of the ballot it's just not quite the same, kind of anticlimactic. So we wanted to give you all a, um, a, a sticker that says I voted. Um, so finally, you know, it is coming soon. Um, we can't wait to share this exhibition with you. It's very special. It has a whole lot of stuff to learn. It it activates objects from our collections in very special ways. It shows what is so 
um, magical about material culture and that how when when combined objects actually really start to sing and tell their own stories and they create the circular communication with you the visitor in ways that um, that that just don't happen any other way so we're really anxious to share this with you uh, stay tuned and check our website for the opening dates and the dates that the museum will be open. You can um, trust that we're working tirelessly behind the scenes to get all that stuff uh, ready to go and ready to be seen. And um, know that it will be up through the end of January. Uh, and we can't, we really can't wait to share it with you. And I just, while I can say this in front of everybody, Jessica and Chandler, it's been such a pleasure, a delight, a, an honor to work with you all on this project. Your um, commitment to it and your and your brains are just um, have have just been so fun to see to see this unfold and to get a chance to to do this. Um, and I hope that this will, I was kidding Jessica earlier in the day. I said, who knows, maybe we'll put it up again in 2024, every election year from this point, every presidential election year from this point forward. But anybody want to say any last thing before we turn it back to Molly? I did have one quick thing. I know there was a question about the colors and why we chose them. Just real quick, we, um, we were really careful throughout this show. We, we really didn't want to, to say one point of view over another in terms of politics. And so we really, unlike our Ida B. Wells broadside, we really wanted to avoid red and blue. Those are just such loaded colors. So then we started thinking about the color scheme of the Victorian era and the, and the suffrage era. And while the suffrage color are purple, white, and gold, and sometimes green, sometimes you see green in there, we wanted to do um, Victorian pastels. So we needed six colors for the different voting stations. So we went with basically a pastel rainbow. It also reminded us of Trivial Pursuit, those little pie wedges that you fill in. Mm -hmm. And then the overarching, the kind of anchor color is based on antique gold. So that's why you get this very deep kind of bronzy brown color and then it lightens up into an antique gold. So that's, that's where it came from. Yeah. Okay, Molly, we're gonna turn it back to you. Thank you so much. Let's see. Do you want to go back so that we can all have our heads together? <laughs> Mary Michael, you want to stop sharing the presentation and we can all come together? Perfect. Welcome back. There we are. <laughs> well, Mary Michael, you're not the only person that's really excited for the exhibition to go up. That's the comments that we're seeing over and over again here in our chat as everyone's really looking forward to coming back to the building and actually getting to play the game in person. So we're all very much looking forward to that. Um, I do want to do a shout out to State Senator Jeannie Darneal, who is joining us tonight for the program. And um, I wish that I had gotten pictures of this thing that she is describing, but on February 13th of this year, a number of us got to go to the state legislature in both the Senate and the House of Representatives to hear all of the female um, uh, members of our local government talk about what suffrage means to them while reading on the floor this specific commemoration that this is the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. And um, the women all wore sashes to acknowledge that, the men all wore white ties, and a number of people actually got to talk about their individual experiences um, being immigrants to the state and then also representing, you know, all women, their districts, um, and getting to serve their state in that way, which was really, really special. But Senator Darneal just said that she made sure to get a suffragist flag, which is signed by all of the female senators and representatives wow. of the 2020 state legislature that she is going to be donating to the Historical Society's collection. So that's awesome. Just like what Chandler Thank was you. saying, 
the story continues, right? Like every day there's something new and we want to make sure that we're acknowledging this ongoing history. So I wanted to make sure to say thank you to Senator Darnell and for bringing up that really special moment and that incredible object that we're going to have in our collection. Um, we also had a number of people say how excited they are to hear from Chandler and Jessica because they have Dead Feminist series prints that they are very much in love with. One in particular that came up was the Taya Foss print. There are still so many things left to do. So a shout out there. Our show now. <laughs> <laughs> Every show. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So there were a few questions specifically about kind of our local history. Um, Mary Manning asked about Emma Smith DeVoe. So she is one of our local suffragists who was based in Tacoma. And um, she pointed out that she actually lived in her house with her husband that's really close to Pacific Lutheran University and the house is still standing. But she was curious, and I think this is an interesting part of the suffrage movement. Um, is there any sheet music from Emma Smith DeVoe that's in our collection or in a local collection? It might be at the at the State Library that has her archives. That would be my guess if there's such a thing, but I couldn't speak to the music question. There are a couple places I might look for that. Um, we have some of her papers. Uh, but I do not recall sheet music, although I will note we have a little book that she used to write jokes in for her speeches, which is really fun. <laughs> and um, just, just for viewers who may not know this, the State Historical Society, we have a research center. And um, once museums are open again and we're able to open the research center to the public, you can make a research request um, to see some of these things. But uh, many of these things are also on our website online. And I hope Lynn can post that link for us. So if you want to find out a little more, um, go to our website. The other place that I would look for information on the Emma Smith DeVoe, possibly as well as State Archives, is the Tacoma Historical Society, which is an excellent resource in all things Tacoma. Um, and they also have a fantastic uh, website and a really great staff there. And the Northwest Room at the library. And the Northwest Room, yes. <laughs> Good catch. At Tacoma Public Library. At Tacoma Absolutely. Public Library, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and Jessica mentioned the, the Washington State Library. They actually have the entire um, papers collection of the Washington State suffragists. So I don't know about sheet music, but they have it's a they have kind of everything. They have like every thank you note anybody ever sent after a luncheon. They have everything, and we poured through all of it when we were researching our broadside about them. So they they would be a great resource. Also, they're down in Tumwater. Um, and I think Sean Langsbury is still um, the contact. I don't know there. So, um, but yeah, they're super helpful. Like every library, every museum, so great. So I just got a message in from. Let's see. Um, I just got a message in from Ben Halley who is with Washington State Archives, and he suggested that you check primarily Washington on the library website. So that's a great place to look. Um, also, when you talking about that joke notebook makes me think of Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I don't know if anyone watches that show, but just like keeping those notes down and making sure to pull those out, you know, whenever they're useful. Are those jokes any good? Have you seen any of those jokes? Eh, they're kind of like dad jokes, except you know, from 1910. <laughs> I guess it'd be mom jokes. <laughs> <laughs> so many great jokes to be had. I'm really interested to see more of that notebook. It's like a different type of lemonade journal than what you all were talking about <laughs> earlier. It's like, I wonder if there's a lot of lemons in there. I'm so curious. Um, I didn't know that Emma Smith DeVoe was known for her joke telling, so I'm intrigued. Yes, she was not. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, There's always something to aspire to, I think you can say. What a lovely thought that is. I, there's always something to work towards, especially, I mean, that seems to be the theme in terms of women's suffrage, right? Like we can always be doing better. We can always be improving. So I appreciate that. Um, 
someone who was incensed, rhododendron versus clover. Say more about this. Like, what? how is the clover making its way in here? What's happening? I know. I have to tell you, I'm team clover. If I could have voted at that time, I would have voted for clover. Not that I have anything against rhododendrons, but I like a good clover. Clover out of my yard. I pulled it all. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> team Rhodey. Sorry, I'm, I'm team clover. I mean, I suspect it was an agricultural thing. Um, I cannot remember, though, and I apologize for that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it's a very interesting factoid and also like leaving the men out of that one is also fascinating. I wonder if that would have turned the tide toward Clover. Who's to say at this point? Um, <laughs> well, it's, it's easier to mow a rhododendron. <laughs> <laughs> Those rhododendrons. Um, also, the voting machine, it's so interesting because I've never actually voted in person. Being from Washington State, we've always done the mail-in vote, so I've always missed out on the stickers, which is a very sad thing. But um, Ben We're also- We're here for you. We're here for you. We've I'm got so excited. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can wear it proudly. Um, ben Helley, again with State Archives, did mention that the voting machine that they have, that they're getting ready to bring over to our collection whenever we're back in person doing that again, weight he says weighs something like three tons which i think is a bit of an exaggeration but <laughs> it is quite heavy imagine just like all of the logistics of having to be setting up all of those voting stations and how lucky we are to get to live in a state where we just get to do the mail the mail and voting so we appreciate that and i will admit to saying that out loud and in public so that um we actually nobody can we get the thing for the yeah. <laughs> Let's get that thing. Sorry, Ben. Mary Michael can <laughs> vouch for the fact that I was ridiculously excited about that. Although it does seem to be my life goal to bring heavy things into exhibitions for which I apologize. <laughs> and, don't, and don't negate the three tons because I remember that gate from McNeil Island exhibition that, you know, they said it was only one ton, but it actually weighed more yeah. than that. <laughs> Yeah, when you're talking about tonnage for exhibitions, I think um, you really have to step back and take stock about which of those objects is important, but those sound like important ones. Um, you know, Jessica's an expert in heavy equipment. I mean, she's got all these presses and <laughs> all them all out here from Chicago. So she, she knows. Ask yeah. her. You can get that in there. Pallet jack, baby. <laughs> hey, it's all about weight distribution. Weight distribution. Mm-hmm. Thank God for that. We can get the experts in for the next time. So we're, we're hiring you, Jessica. Um, <laughs> so uh, you were bringing up all sorts of different suffragists, um, Ida B. Wells, and Ida B. Wells being primarily in Chicago. What is the balance between our, the stories of our local women and suffragists versus um, our national suffragists in the exhibition? I think um, that was a big uh, that was actually something that it really, it really helped to have Gwen and Mary Michael kind of guiding the ship there because we, we had all these different elements that we were trying to bring together and Mary Michael was so great at bringing the focus back. Like, how does this, how does this, suff how, how does this voting rights thing deal with suffrage? How does it deal with women? How does it deal with Washington? And so actually beforehand, before we started sorting everything into the different panels for the show, we actually wrote reams and reams and reams of text, much of which didn't make it into the final show. But um, we took it point by point, every topic we were talking about, every um, station in the game, we had all of these different topics. And then we'd say, how does this relate to women? How does this relate to Washington State? And sometimes it, the answer was really easy. And sometimes it was hard. And we had to go back and do more research. So it doesn't it didn't all make it into the show but we really tried to have at least touch points throughout the show where we can give people anchors and say okay so here's what was happening nationally here's what here's what was happening in washington state and here's how what women were talking about how what this means nationwide for all voters so it was really a good lens to look at the show so we hope that we're kind of presenting multiple sides by doing this and and having this parallel view of Washington versus the nation. I will say that was one of the most challenging things, even when we, when we started thinking about the suffrage centennial in general, 
and how we were going to commemorate it and how and that that was what informed the development of that framework that I first showed at the beginning because we wanted to show certainly we want to talk about Washington history but because we had already done that and because the story that we were celebrating wasn't the story of Washington it was the story of how that story in Washington connected to the larger national story certainly the west coast really kind of got the party started for um suffrage in the 20th century but this was the ultimate in group projects you know it was the ultimate in collaboration because it had you know this had to be ratified in every state so i think that um once again, you know, I just sort of marveled at the um, approach that Jessica and Chandler took to this because, like she said, there's a lot that didn't make it in, but it's all sort of underneath it. You can really feel that density of um, research and, um, and the timeline really is a thing of beauty. I mean, it's almost an exhibition within an exhibition because you could spend a whole lot of time just just work working your way around the perimeter of the space and not even playing the game. Mary Michael, can I talk just a tiny bit about that timeline? Um, yeah. That timeline was something that Mary Michael and Gwen put together most of the content for and we kind of fit it around the room. But then um, when the pandemic hit, at the very beginning, we had this breakthrough actually for that content. And because suddenly we had this major thing that was outside of our control and we thought, oh my God, we have to put a new element into the timeline. So we came up with these, these panels that interrupt the timeline and we call them game changer panels. So it's not just the COVID-19 pandemic. It's all of these major events in world history that upended everybody and got in the way of everybody's nice little carefully laid plans. So we have World War I, World War II, the pandemic of 1918, Civil War, uh, the Civil Rights Movement, Vietnam War, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that gave us this whole new lens of looking at it and thinking, how did these people continue with their causes when the world turned everything upside down and it was completely out of their control? And unfortunately, we are learning firsthand what that is like so that became a major thing for that for that timeline and really that i think of that timeline as being sort of like a corset for the show it's like the <laughs> uh, garment, foundational garments for the show <laughs> i love that uh. i would add to that in doing the research some really interesting specific washington state things came to light that that I confess I didn't know about, like the idea of faithless electors and that we had four in Washington state. And so learning about that and profiling um, Levi Guerra as one of them was really cool to be able to include her story um, as a really young voter. I think she was 17 or, or no, she was 18, yeah. just 18. Yeah. So, um, some of that stuff just comes by, it, it feels like kismet, but I think it's sometimes just the magic of research and then these, these ideas on earth and, and it feels right and connects those dots. Mm -hmm. Research is magical. It's funny because like working at the Historical Society, we so often go down, Gwen and I joke, rabbit holes. That's what we call her office because so often it's like doing these deep dives, but like you're saying that kismet seems to happen and then you know you can draw the connector between all of these different moments in history and to chandler's point you really when you're thinking about women's suffrage you tend to look through that one lens but really there's so many outside influences and twists and turns and changes that the story wouldn't be what it is without knowing like the broader picture so it's great that that is there yeah absolutely um there a thing that came out while we were working on this was the 1619 project, which was a supplemental insert to the New York Times that was kind of spearheaded by Nicole Hannah Jones, who actually won a Pulitzer for that work. Um, and Ida B. Wells was awarded a posthumous Pulitzer at the same time. So everything comes full circle. <laughs> but what the 1619 project talked about was how so many of the problems in our society and the everyday things that we take for granted are rooted in the history of slavery. And this came up again and again and again when we were 
putting together the show. And so when we, I'm thinking especially about Gerrymander Lane. So we were, I worked on that one as well. And I was writing about the history of gerrymandering and I barely understood gerrymandering. I still barely understand gerrymandering. This stuff is complicated, people. Um, so I'm sitting here trying to design a graphic to explain how gerrymandering works. And I'm using these little, and you know, these vintage cuts of these little houses and trying to divide them up in different ways and my brain is breaking. And then oh, I fell down this rabbit hole of research and I learned about how gerrymandering has an incredible amount in common with unfair race-based housing practices that are still being, there's an expose just last year by the New York Post talking about realtors on Long Island are still, um, segregating neighborhoods and these things are all connected and we kept finding this again and again and again which only underscored mary michael's um goal of talking about having having 1920 being the beginning of the story not the end of the story and, and that is so fascinating to me and the graphic that you came up with by the way <laughs> perfect it works perfectly i can't wait for everybody to see it <laughs> How's that for a teaser? Yeah. Well, there's all of these like very complicated, complex issues. You're talking about intersectionality and how that impacts the story. I wonder, like, what do you hope people walk away with? Like, how do you want them to feel? What do you want them to know? Um, what are they taking away once they've played this game? I hope they feel determined determined to vote and to help other people vote. That is my, that's my big wish coming out of this. And if they can understand gerrymandering slightly better, I'll be happy to. Yeah, I would exactly what Chandler says. And I think one of the concerns about voting is just this hopelessness that it's, it, it's not effective. It doesn't work. Why vote anyway? And if, if they feel different after spinning that wheel, that makes a huge difference. And to have that focus on voting happen because of the pandemic is, is actually, I think, really fortuitous in a strange way. I think one of the things that I love the most about the structure of the game that we finally landed on, we. It, this had multiple iterations. We started uh, we we started off thinking about a timeline that you would vote along the way, um, a timeline of history. Um, but it we weren't we knew we weren't going to be able to tease out the complicated layers and nuances of these stories, and so we abandoned that early on. We also wanted people who were not 18 or we, we didn't want to tie it to actual voting because we wanted every age, every person who came through the exhibition to have agency, to be able to see the fruits of their labor right away. And so that's how we came up with the structure of like having these objects that are some metaphorical, some actually not really pretty direct. But for me, in, at the History Museum, I always say that I know an exhibition is successful if somebody leaves going, I had not thought of it that way, whatever it is, or I, I didn't know that, you know? And so if they say one of those two things or both, then I feel like they'll be motivated to do, you know, to vote and to know that they have that, um, that power that, that Ida B. Wells talks about, that John Lewis talks about, that we all know that voting is the, is the one thing that we can do to actually affect change in our world locally and it's, it telescopes forward. So I also love the idea that we talk about things, not just presidential elections, but other elections too. One of the things I guess I hope for out of this exhibition, and to be honest, I kind of hope for it out of every exhibition, is that people who come to it will find some sense of historical empathy. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be throughout the entire exhibition, but they'll find that moment where they really feel like the exhibit spoke to them. 
whether it's someone that inspires them, someone who looks like them, someone who speaks in a voice similar to one that they love. And having that personal connection will kind of help, will help both, you know, re remembering what they saw, but I think it also helps you learn to value your own voice and to carry that voice forward. So I would be remiss if I didn't say that this goes back to our mission here at the Historical Society to really explore how history does connect us all. And I think that that is, um, I think that's what you'll find here. All the content in this exhibition are things that we all have in common um, and that do connect us. There is a thread there. Literally a needle and thread. Oh yeah. <laughs> that's what I am, I'm that. <laughs> like I'm just looking forward to getting those thank you notes from our fourth grade visitors saying like thank you I now understand gerrymandering and I've told everyone at home <laughs> exactly how all of this works and how we don't want to participate in that anymore <laughs> of fourth graders who are going to hear a lot about gerrymandering <laughs> Well, we can't wait for that and for all of us to be able to actually be in the building and play the game ourselves. Are there any final thoughts before we conclude for this evening? Thank you for the opportunity. We have been uh, challenged and amazed at um, the resources. And I didn't get to mention um, just picking the objects. Like you don't have just one ballot box. There was like, 20 to choose from. <laughs> There's such depth there that it's it's really amazing. So I I love that part of it. Yeah. Um, when Mary Michael mentioned the thousand words show that we were brought in, and Washington authors got to pick an object to tell a story about, and Jessica and I can't ever pick an object. So. <laughs> archives I and mean, we've never actually been in there before and it's this amazing it's like the it's like the haunted mansion filled with amazing stuff and we got to walk around and we're like can can we just can we just pick a few things <laughs> and Mackenzie said sure you could pick a few things and I think we do we pick like 12 things or like I don't even remember what they were all really good it things. was like 25 things <laughs> a week of the show to tell the story and and so when we got to go back again to pick objects for the show, we got to go through the archives again, and it was, it was incredible. That's, that is really the joy for us. I mean, we got to write this amazing stuff, and we got to play with this imagery, but getting to troll the archives, that was awesome. <laughs> wow. You made the good stuff sing, as they say. So thank you so much. We're just so grateful, and I can't wait to share this with everyone. Um, really. Yeah, we're really the ones that are grateful to get to collaborate with you all on the great work that you've already been doing. And I want to make sure people know that you can go to www.deadfeminist.com to learn more. You can see the brand new broadside, Ida B. Wells. Make sure that you're checking that out. It's just beautiful. It's totally stunning. Um, and then follow Dead Feminist on Instagram as well. I think it's at Dead Feminist, correct? Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And Gwen and Mary Michael, it's always a pleasure to get to have you for a program since you're so often behind the scenes at the museum doing all of the good work on exhibitions. So thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. We so appreciate getting to share the museum with you, even though we're not there in person right now. So thank you again for joining us for the Washington State Home Society. Um, you can follow us online, check our website for all of our other upcoming virtual programs at that link provided right there. And then also please do consider donating to the Washington State Historical Society if you like the program, um, if you wanna support the collections that Jessica and Chandler get to mine, um, you can do that there too. Um, or also if you wanna join us as members and support us that way. But thank you so much for joining us this evening and we look forward to seeing you on September 10th for all of our first In the Spirit related programming. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, bye.